and if some of you remember four years ago, I spoke on Palm Sunday. Yeah. And I talked about the palm branch. Yeah. And I learned from the palm branch that it represented goodness and victory. So I'm not going to talk about the palm branch today. <laughs> I was led to go a different direction. But I believe my message today will be appropriate <clears throat> since we are in the season of celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes. Celebrating his shed blood. <clears throat> So my message today is going to be talking about the song that we just heard. The name of the song says, this means war. <laughs> but the part that I want to talk to you about is, I plead the blood. I grew up hearing people say, I plead the blood. And I myself said it, because I heard them say it, I plead the blood. Without knowing what it really meant. Had an idea, but I didn't really know what it was meaning by I plead the blood. And I hear people saying it today, so this song is not new. It goes, and this song might be new, but those words, I plead the blood, goes way back. And I hear people saying it today, and I wonder, do they really know what they're saying? So I have been moved to look into the meaning of pleading the blood. So the title of my message is, what does it mean to plead, the, to plead the blood, and how do I do that? What does it mean to plead the, to plead the blood, and how do I do that? After hearing people say, I plead the blood for so many years, and not seeing any changes in that situation, I thought, there must be more to it than just saying those words. I've said it myself without seeing any changes, although I said it hesitantly because I really didn't know what it meant. So I figured there must be more to it than just saying, I plead the blood. As I began to look into it, I could not find the phrase in the Bible, I plead the blood. I didn't find it. I went on the Internet and I read there that they were, some of the people were saying, you don't say that. You don't say I plead the blood. And the reason for saying it, they said, because it's not in the Bible. In fact, they were putting people down for saying it because it's not in the Bible. Although the phrase I plead the blood is not in the Bible, that does not mean the principle is not in the Bible. The word Trinity in describing God is also not in the Bible. But that does not mean that the principle of Trinity is not in the Bible. Trinity means three. In several places in scripture, God is referred to as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. They make up the Godhead, which we call the Trinity, the one God. The word rapture is also not in the Bible, but the principle is there. Rapture means to be caught up or carried away. Although the word rapture is not in the Bible, the principle is certainly there. And we can find it in 1 Thessalonians, 4th chapter the 16th and 17th verse. And it reads as follows. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now that describes rapture, being caught up. So I don't want you to think that because the phrase, I plead the blood, is not in the Bible, that you should not use it, as they were saying on the Internet. The principle is certainly there. So I'll be talking to you about what is pleading the blood and how do we do that. 
that we might reap the benefits of Jesus' shed blood. Blood is a life and death matter, whether it's our natural human blood or the blood of Jesus. Both are vitally important for life. As Leviticus 17 and 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. To prove that point, if you drain all the blood out of your body, you will die. Even if blood failed to circulate to any part of your body, that part will die, and the doctor will have to amputate it. It's the blood that keeps it alive. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us spiritual life. In fact, that's why Jesus came. He said, you must be born again. He came into this world alive physically, but we came here spiritually dead. We came separated from God, and that's spiritual death. Spiritual death is being separated from God. Our spirit is dead and need to be made alive. And that's done by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ and receiving him into your heart. Jesus' blood really does give life. Blood is the foundation of our existence, our physical existence and our spiritual existence. Without the blood flowing through the veins of our physical body, we would not be alive. Without Jesus' blood, we would still be dead and separated from God. Once you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, you receive all of the benefits of his shed blood. You become a recipient of Jesus' blood and all that his blood provides. His sole purpose for coming to this earth was to die in our place, shed his blood that we may have life. So when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive his life with all of the benefits of his shed blood. As your natural physical body forms many complicated functions in your body, so does the blood of Jesus. I was amazed when I read about all the different functions of the blood that flows through our veins. Very complicated indeed. I read that even some scientists have not been able to figure out all the complicated functions of the blood. And as the natural human blood is complicated, so is the blood of Jesus. His blood, too, has many complicated functions. But I thank God that we do not have to understand it all. All we have to do is believe what the word of God says about the blood of Jesus and receive it by faith. Although we don't have to understand it, we do need to know what the word says about his blood, that our faith might be established in what the blood of Jesus has done, that we might reap the benefits. So what does it mean to plead the blood of Jesus, and how do we do that? First, I will give what pleading the blood is not. Pleading the blood is not begging God for something. It's not a magic formula to get your prayers answered. It's not like a magic word that the world uses, such as abracadabra, open sesame, or whatever they use today. But sad to say, some Christians use the phrase as if it is a magic formula to get an immediate answer to their prayers. It's not a magic formula. Some people have the idea we must say certain things in a certain way in order to be heard by God. The power is not just in the words you say, although your words are very important. But we must believe the word we speak, and we must speak it in faith if we want to reap the benefits. Some of the benefits, and there are many, many benefits that we can reap from the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some of the benefits can be found in Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5. Some of the benefits that God is saying, he forgiveth all your iniquities. He heals all of your diseases. He redeems your life from destruction. He crowneth you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. These are some of the benefits of being a child of God. The benefits 
of his shed blood. But we must believe it. So what does it mean to say I plead the blood? I started by looking up the word plead. And in the dictionary, it gives several definitions. So based on the definitions, I narrowed it down. The word plead means to proclaim, to declare something forcefully, or to defend yourself. To proclaim, to declare, and do that forcefully, and to defend yourself. Pleading the blood covers a large area. The phrase, I plead the blood, is short for evoking the blessings of God upon yourself, upon your family, and upon your situation. To say, I plead the blood, is to proclaim that you know and believe what the blood of Jesus has provided for you. And you are boldly declaring it. It means you are applying the blood to your situation. It means you are defending yourself by declaring war. I see pleading the blood in the same light as when you are in a situation, and all you can say is, Jesus. Jesus, because there is power in the name of Jesus. And as I was writing this, the Lord brought back to my mind several years ago when I woke up, had a stroke. My right side was paralyzed. I was able to pull myself up in a sitting position in the bed. As I was sitting there, my foot on my right side began to curl under. And I began with my left hand to take that foot and try to pull it back. And all I was saying was Jesus. I just kept saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus." And after a while, that foot began to straighten out. And the feeling became back into my right side. So there is power in the name of Jesus. Same as when you say, I plead the blood. When you plead the blood, you bring that blood in in, in on your condition. There is power in the blood of Jesus. In pleading the blood, you are declaring war against the attacks and the accusations brought by the enemy. And you are doing it boldly and forcefully. Boldly because when you go to war, you don't go acting scared and timid. You go with confidence, declaring your rights, and your privileges as a child of God. You declare it based upon what the word says about what Jesus shed his blood for. In order to do it boldly and confidently, then you need to know what the blood of Jesus has done. And you need to believe that his blood was shed for you. To recap, pleading the blood means you are evoking the blessings of God. You are applying the blood to your situation. You are defending yourself by declaring war against the enemy. Satan is constantly attacking and accusing us. And our only defense is what the word says, the blood of Jesus has provided for us. That's what pleading the blood means. Now, how do we do that? We plead the blood with our heart and our mouth. As I said before, The phrase, I plead the blood, is not in the Bible, but the principle is there. The principle is speaking with your mouth what you are believing in your heart. This is mentioned in several places in the Bible. Psalms 116 and 10 is one place. Mark 11, 23 is another. Romans 10 and 8 through 10 is another. And then 2 Corinthians 4, 13 all speaks of the principle of pleading the blood with your heart and your mouth. So we plead the blood by declaring emphatically what the blood of Jesus has provided. Jesus' death on the cross and his shed blood has provided everything that we will ever need. First of all, in order to plead the blood, you need to know what the blood of Jesus has done. Second, you need to believe that his blood was shed for you and that it covers everything that you need. Third, You need to lay claims on what his blood has provided. You claim it by speaking with your mouth what you are believing in your heart. 
It's boldly proclaiming what the blood has done. And you don't do it timidly. You speak boldly and confidently. The heart and the mouth working together brings about what you say. It's not just saying the words. It's believing the words that you say. The heart and the mouth must work together in order to get results. Romans 10 and 8 is telling us about the heart and the mouth. Romans 10 and 8 in the Message Bible says, the word that saves is right here. As near as a tongue in your mouth, as close as the heart in your chest. It is the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and set things right for us. Did you get that? Oh, my God. It is the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and set things right for us. You have to believe it and speak it. The speaking is the action part of faith. You have to speak it in order to receive it. 2 Corinthians 4.13, Paul says, backing up the speaking, we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written. I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Paul was referring back to Psalms 116 and 10. I believed, therefore have I spoken. You got to believe it first. Believe it, and when you speak it, it's going to come to pass. Romans 10 and 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This word salvation covers everything that Jesus' death has provided. But it's with the heart and the mouth that we receive it. So in order to plead the blood, you need to know what the blood of Jesus has done. You need to believe that everything his blood purchased belongs to you. And you need to confess it, speak it out, declaring what his blood has done. So when you say, I plead the blood, you are speaking in faith, what the blood has done. The scripture says, according to your faith, be it unto you. So what are you believing? What you believe is very important. It's your faith in what the blood of Jesus has done that matters. The blood of Christ not only forgives us, it cleanses us from all sin and all unrighteousness. The blood makes us heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. Being heirs of God makes us heirs to the new covenant. Being heirs of the new covenant, Paul says, all things are yours right now. You don't have to wait. It all belongs to you because you are heir to the covenant. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23 in the Message Bible says, I don't want to hear any of you bragging about yourselves or anyone else. Everything is already yours as a gift. Everything is already yours as a gift, whether Paul, Apollos, Peter, whether the world, whether life, whether death, whether the present or the future. All of it is yours, and you are privileged to be in union with Christ, who is in union with God. And I just love that verse. I love that. It lets me know that these things are mine because I belong to God. And I'm a joint heir to everything that Christ owns. Everything that Christ has debt paid for is already yours. Just waiting for you to believe it and reach out in faith and receive it. Forgiveness is yours. Peace and joy is yours. Healing is already yours. Strength is yours. Protection is yours. Deliverance is yours. Provision is yours. Freedom is yours. You have freedom in Christ. Galatians 5 and 1 in the NLT says, So Christ has already set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. In other words, don't let Satan put you back in bondage. God has paid the price for you to be free. And he did it with his blood. So he's now saying, don't go back into bondage. Whatever I 
have delivered you from, don't go back to that. Amen. Satan is constantly trying to get you back in. But he said, don't go back. You don't have to go back. And when Satan tried to get you back in bondage, you can boldly defend yourself by telling him what the blood of Jesus has done. Tell him, I'm no longer under your control, for I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 107 and 2 tells us, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hands of the enemy. Thanks, you've been redeemed. You don't have to be under the control of Satan anymore. Being redeemed gives you authority over the devil. So you can plead the blood by testifying to the fact that I have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. Testify by speaking what the blood of Jesus has done. When you speak what you are believing in your heart, you will get what you say. For with the heart man believeth, and with the mouth he speaketh. And the Holy Spirit is sitting there waiting to hear the word so he can bring it about. So, saints, I plead the blood is not to be used as a magic charm or a magic formula. We don't need to use magic words to make our prayers heard. We only need to believe and speak what the word says. Your prayers are heard because you are a child of God. And when you lay claim on that which belongs to you, that gets God's attention. Your claim is based upon the fact that Jesus shed his blood and he did it for you. I see nothing wrong with pleading the blood. I see nothing wrong with that phrase. As long as you understand what it means. As I said before, it's not just repeating those words that gets God's attention. You must believe the word in your heart and speak it with your mouth. Then you will receive what you say. That means you will have to find out what the word, what the Bible says about the blood. That means you got to do some reading. You got to get your book out and you got to read it. You got to make sure you're at church to hear somebody else that's telling you about what it says. So once you know what it says, then you have to make a decision that I'm going to believe that. Then when you, re and when you reach the point of believing, then you can proclaim what the word says about the shed blood of Jesus. And that's called pleading the blood. To say I plead the blood is a shortcut to saying what you believe the blood covers. So what does the blood cover? What has the blood of Jesus done? And what is it still doing for you? His blood purchased you. Acts 20 and 28 and 1 Peter 1 19 says, you have been purchased with the precious blood of Christ. In other words, you have been brought back from the domain or from the control of Satan. And you were bought with the precious blood of Jesus. What has he done? He has brought you back into right relationship with God by the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2 and 13 says, You who were sometime afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You can now call him Abba, Father, and he calls you his child. You are no longer alienated and separated from God. You are united with him, joined unto him. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, he who is joined to the Lord is one with him. Can you imagine that? Can you just imagine that you being one with God. Jesus in the 17th chapter of uh, John, that was part of his prayer. The Father, make them one as we are one. As I'm in you and you in me, make them one in us. I, it's my prayer that God would give all of us a revelation of us being really that close to God that we are joined with him as one. We are all one with God the Father and God the Son. So that's what the blood has done for us. It's brought us back together as one. So what does his blood do? It protects you. As the children of Israel was protected from the death angel by the blood of the lamb that was painted on the doorposts of their houses, likewise, we are covered and protected by the blood of the lamb who is Jesus Christ. 
We are protected by his blood that is applied to our hearts when we received him as Lord and Savior. His blood cleanses and forgives you of all sins and all unrighteousness. Matthew 26 and 28 in the NIV says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Colossians 1.14 says, In Christ we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Your sins are forgiven. They are paid for by the blood of Jesus. Through his blood, you have authority over the enemy. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give unto you power, and that word power means authority. I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Having authority gives you legal rights to the name of Jesus. You are his representative in the earth. And Jesus said, Take my name and go cast out devils. You shall speak with tongues, new tongues. You shall take up serpents. And if you're drinking the deadly thing, it won't even hurt you. You shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Being a representative of Jesus gives you the right to plead the blood of Jesus over the attacks and the accusations of the enemy. You can tell the devil, I have authority over you. You can tell your body, I'm healed. By his stripes, I'm healed. God says he heals all diseases. So I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. You can tell your circumstances, I'm an overcomer. I am a more than a conqueror. Tell them that. Speak it boldly and forcefully. Remember, it's not just saying the words. You must believe what the blood of Jesus has done. It's believing and speaking that brings results. You must believe that because Jesus shed his blood, that all the promises of God belongs to you now. In order to benefit from the blood, you have to cooperate with what the word instructs you to do. That means spend the time in the word to find out what his blood has done. Once you know what his blood has done, set your heart to believe it. Then start confessing it. We live physically day by day by the blood flowing through our veins. We also live spiritually day by day by Jesus' blood flowing through us. As the blood in our physical body can be restricted from flowing to every part of the body, we must be mindful, to, we must be mindful not to restrict the flow of Jesus' blood. As plaque builds up in our arteries can restrict or stop the flow of blood in our bodies. Likewise, If we allow spiritual plaque to build up, it will restrict or stop the blessings of God from flowing unto you. Did you get that? Spiritual plaque blocks the blood flow flowing to you from God. So in order to keep his blood flowing freely, we must give regular attention to the word of God. That's your nourishment. We must not allow unconfessed sin to build up. That restricts the flow. We must be quick to forgive because if we don't, we restrict the flow of the blessing. We must show love at all times. When we don't, we restrict the blessing. We must be quick to apologize when we have wronged someone. If we don't, we restrict the blessing. We must drink often the cup which represents the blood of Jesus. Jesus is saying in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Drinking the cup keeps a clear flow of his blood when it's done in faith. So when you take communion, drink the cup believing that Jesus' blood is flowing to every need that you may have. The cup is a new covenant in his blood, and you are a covenant partner. Everything in the new covenant is already yours because you are an heir to the covenant. So all things are already yours, but you must believe it and speak it in order to receive it. 
That's what it means to plead the blood. You are declaring what the blood of Jesus has done, and you are claiming it by faith. This evokes all of the blessings of God. As there is power in the word of God, there is power in the name of Jesus, and there is power in the blood of Jesus. I believe there is a song that they used to sing a long time ago. There is power in the name of Jesus, in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you.